the same religion that's capable of hideous acts of destruction can also be capable of moments of healing, of restoration, and of hope. But educate a girl, and you educate her entire family. There is a sun within every person. When that anger sets in, write it. Write the letters, but don't send them. You never want to leave concrete proof of insanity. Greetings. Well, it's very nice to see so many people turning out because torture is a critical issue in America. And I'm honored to be able to introduce tonight's program, the featured speaker being Mark Danner. But before that, one of the things I wanted to stress is that this whole series of programming takes into consideration perspectives from the humanities. And we were very, very lucky to be able to have, get a piece of video art, which we're going to be starting the program with. This piece, titled The United States Code, Section 2340A, is a response by two California artists to our government's use of so-called coercive interrogation tactics on detainees in the U.S. War on Terror. After the first torture memos authored by government lawyers became public in 2004, Nancy Pop and Serena Wellen were dismayed by the public's tacit acceptance of this policy of torture. The artists responded with a video work which pairs the dehumanizing language of the Justice Department lawyers with the sound of a populace inured to the spectacle of torture in the media. Nancy Pop and uh, Ser Serena Wellen have been collaborating for over a year on work which investigates the subject of torture. Nancy is here today. Could Nancy stand up? I don't know where you are. I just wanted to point. There's Nancy. And so she will be. Uh... <laughs> so please feel free to speak to Nancy after the program and check your program for inserts of, uh, for further information about their work. And now we'll present um, the video.
Um, well, anyway, first of all, I, again, I would like to express my gratitude that so many of you have shown up and um, the, to begin this series, which, as Elizabeth um, Weber has stated, opens a set of programming that will continue through May. The title is Torture in the Future, Perspectives from the Humanities. And we could not have a better speaker to launch this campaign-wide series than Mark Danner, whose work epitomizes clear-headed and moral perspectives on torture, human rights, and the future. Mark Danner has at least two careers. He's a writer and journalist who publishes regularly in the New Yorker and the New York Review of Books, among others. And his most recent book, actually his most recent two books, which he will be signing after this event, since Borders is located um, in the lobby and, and the two books will be for sale. The most recent is The Secret Way to War, The Downing Street Memo, and The Iraq War's Buried History. And the uh, second most recent book, which was published in 2004, is Torture and Truth, America, Abu Ghraib, and the War on Terror. And his first book, just to go back to his career, published in 1994, developed from a groundbreaking investigation about El Salvador, titled um, The Massacre at El Mazote, A Parable of the Cold War. And I would also mention that he has a forthcoming book um, on Haiti, based on decades of uh, his research and writing in that, in that country. But Mark Danner is also a professor at two separate institutions. He's a professor of journalism at Berkeley, where he also directs the Goldman Forum on the Press and Foreign Affairs. And at Bard College in upstate New York, he's the Henry R. Luce Professor of Human Rights, Democracy, and Journalism. I cannot begin to do justice to his professional achievements and political interventions, and would direct you to his wonderful website, markdanner.com, which includes um, hyperlinks to many of his um, articles, audio tapes, and videotapes of his debates, and for the faculty in the audience, a fabulous collection of syllabi. Um, we were eager to have Mark Danner open this UCSB series because of his capacity to articulate the case for why and how the humanities matter in this political moment. This is exemplified in many ways in his work, but in particular in a commencement address that he delivered in 2005 to the graduating English majors at Berkeley. And I would say that I found this, or I came across this on the internet, it was circulating, the speech. It probably has tens of thousands of people who have read it. But in this commencement speech, he turned on his head the notion that English students might have chosen a useless major. He argued that those who study language and literature are exceptionally well suited to understand and intervene in political conflicts of this era in which the most powerful government in the world has manipulated language, specifically the language of law, to authorize torture. And I quote Danner from his uh, commencement speech. English majors and other determined humanists distinguish themselves not only by reading Shakespeare or Chaucer or Joyce or Wolfe or Zora Neale Hurston, but by refusing in the face of overwhelming pressure to answer that question of how will you justify yourself as an English major. They see developing the moral imagination as more important than securing economic self-justification. Whether you know it or not, by declaring yourself as questioners, as humanists, you already have gone some way in defining yourselves for good or ill as outsiders. Danner's speech um, is a beautiful homage to idealists, that is, those who honor the ideal that human life is valuable and counterposes them to would-be realists, the ones who argue that war will bring peace, that bombs will set people free, that torture will make us safer. I'd like to read one more quote from that commencement address, again quoting Danner. I think I became a writer in part because I found a yawning difference between what I was told and what I could see to be inescapable. I started by writing about wars and massacres and violence. After two decades of this, of Salvador and Haiti and Bosnia and Iraq, my mother, who already had to cope with the anxiety of a son acquiring a very expensive education in modern literature and aesthetics, still asks periodically, can't you go someplace nice for a change? Lucky for us, Danner has resisted the temptation or the maternal implorations to go someplace nice for a change. Danner has gone and keeps on going to some of the least nice places and has written about some of the very worst things that people do to other people. 
And the knowledge he gathers and shares through his writing and speaking has consistently and effectively exposed and explained and challenged human rights violations and other horrors. If there is a reason to be hopeful for the future, it is nourished by Danner's work. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to present Mark Danner. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lisa. Any introduction that mentions my mother prominently, I, I love and agree with. I just wish she was here. She would claim uh, space on the stage. She's a big hog. But I've let her imploration, is what you called it, why can't you go somewhere nice for a change, uh, be a guide over the last year. I went to Brazil once, and the whole time I was in Brazil, I told people, I'm here because of my mother. Um, thank you very much uh, to UCSB Arts and Lectures um, and uh, to the designers and organizers of Torture in the Future uh, under the Critical Issues in America series for having me here tonight. And thank you, all of you, for turning out in such numbers to hear about such a fundamentally grim topic. Um, I want to take a second to thank some of the people who are responsible for my coming, um, not just Lisa Hajar and Elizabeth Weber, uh, Professor Giles Gunn, Richard Falk, uh, Roman Baradiak of Arts and Lectures, uh, especially Stan Roden and Phyllis DiPicciato, uh, who supported the visit, um, and of course the Chancellor, uh, Chancellor Yang. I'm very grateful to you for, for helping me come here to talk to you tonight. Um, just before Actually, as we were leaving the restaurant a little while ago, um, I asked Professor Gunn what he thought his students would like to hear me talk about when it came to torture. And he said, uh, talk about what you think of it now, how you feel about it now. Um, and this, I must tell you, cut me to the quick because, um, as Lisa mentioned, I first published a book on, on torture um, three years ago, more than three years ago. Uh, and one of the things we have to confront as humanists um, is not simply, it seems to me, the fact of torture uh, and that the United States, uh, in various of its agencies and organizations, has been practicing it, but something even in a way graver, which is that we've known about it um, for about almost five years now. The first major article about torture, and it was quite specific, appeared in the Washington Post in late 2002. Uh, so if we are to look at this issue as, as humanists, and Lisa quoted very well um, from a lecture I gave about the importance of humanism and looking at so-called public policy problems. If we're going to look at this as humanists, we find that if our eyes turn first, inevitably, to those morbid scenes of degradation uh, that Ab Abbe DuBose spoke about, which are inherently uh, attractive in some terrible way, if our eyes turn first to those, they have to finish by turning to look at ourselves. Because, as a matter of fact, uh, I'm not up here tonight to reveal anything to you that you don't already know. Um, you saw just now an extraordinary, I thought, video uh, made up entirely of the words of your government uh, in a series of memos, I think several memos, uh, by which torture was justified using all of the combined intellectual firepower that the government can bring to bear in the Department of Justice and then the Department of Defense, um, also the White House. So these procedures that I'm going to talk about um, were not only justified at the highest levels of government um, and put into effect and imposed by people far down the chain of responsibility. Uh, they were written about in the press, 
exposed by some of the practitioners at Abu Ghraib, which is now almost three years ago that those photographs were published, and read about, thought about, pondered by us. And as a society, uh, we're still pondering. Um, I titled my talk tonight, Into the Light of Day, uh, to try to <laughs> inject, at the beginning at least, a note of optimism. Um, and I have this problem when I want to start optimistically, I inevitably veer, as you can tell already, in the other direction. <laughs> and I apologize for that. Um, but into the light of day, that phrase comes from one of my favorite operas, uh, Fidelio, um, when the uh, prisoners come out of the dungeon in the, second, or in the final act um, and see the light coming down. Um, and it, I guess, was a gesture of mine implying that many of these issues are now joined politically five years, four years later, joined legally, and that we will see them in coming months played out on the national political stage in a different way than we've seen them played out before. Um, inevitably, the New York Times uh, does something convenient on the day I'm to give a talk, and today they led with a story, court to oversee U.S. wiretapping uh, in terror cases. Um, and this is a very small movement in that direction by which the administration has now decided that they will let the court that's legally uh, empowered um, to grant the government permission to wiretap, which they have ignored and bypassed as a matter of policy uh, up to now, since 2001, they are now considering, and it looks like we'll let that court uh, have some role in approving wiretaps. Uh, and it's clear, I think, that this is the beginning of an argument that's going to go on, in the na on the national level about what has happened since 9-11 to what we like to call our civil rights and our human rights and how our self-conception of a country that protects those things, that is inherently built around the idea of protecting those things, has dramatically changed uh, over the last five years and more. Anyway, that's the optimistic part of my talk. <laughs> um, and I wanted to quote, by the way, this lovely line of Elizabeth Weber's um, about torture in the announcement of the Critical Issues in American series. Uh, she says, and I agree wholly, the perspectives of social science alone cannot adequately comprehend what is at stake. The humanities might offer more productive methods towards an ethics and a politics of response and resistance. Uh, and she said, of course, just now from this stage, that torture devastates the principles and practices of democracy. And we have to ask ourselves, it seems to me, why that, in a fundamental way, isn't true. Which is to say, the democracy that we know, that we've lived in these past years, has in fact been able to sit by and read in the press and watch pictures on television of these practices that contravene what we say is our most fundamental or are our most fundamental values. Anyway, enough hectoring on that score. I thought what I would do is begin uh, by reading a bit of testimony um, about torture from people who have been tortured, um, uh, first in Abu Ghraib. Um, again, these documents have been in the public uh, domain uh, since 2004. Um, they're included in my book. Um, the first one is the testimony of someone who is called Detainee Seven. Uh, he's an Iraqi man who belonged to Saddam's Republican Guard, who was picked up at a checkpoint in September 2003. Now, if you remember September 2003, this was about the time that the insurgency in Iraq was becoming undeniable as insurgency. Uh, the top of the Defense Department, notably Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, was still denying that this was an insurgency, but in fact, finally it was becoming undeniable that this was going on. And the American military in Iraq reacted to this by uh, launching what are called cordon and capture operations. Uh, that's when you cordon off a neighborhood uh, using your Humvees and tanks and so on, Bradley uh, uh, vehicles, and you go house to house within the neighborhood, you knock down doors, 
uh, you search very aggressively. And in this case, uh, over a period of months, the American military would essentially arrest the young men. Um, they would take in the men between, you know, 18 and 30, and they would bring them to Abu Ghraib. Uh, and it was kind of a catch-all operation where the thought was, well, some of these guys must know about the insurgency. We'll interrogate them. There was a degree of desperation in this American effort uh, that has persisted, frankly, in Iraq. Um, anyway, Detainee 7 was picked up. He was essentially brought to Abu Ghraib because he had in his pocket a card that identified him as a member of... Uh, of Saddam's army, um, and he was captured for that reason. He hadn't done anything, uh, but he was made a so-called intelligence hold, which means he was a prisoner of interest to the intelligence people. And uh, the army investigative unit sat down with all these detainees who'd been abused, quote unquote, and they interviewed them. Uh, so this is an interview d performed by American soldiers and American investigators, and he describes what happened to him in the fall of 2003. Uh, and he is, his name was not made public, by the way, because, well, you'll, you'll see. And I, I warn you, this is a little difficult to listen to, as are a number of things I'm going to talk about tonight. Um, <clears throat> the first day, they put me in a dark room and started hitting me in the head and stomach and legs. They made me raise my hands and sit on my knees. I was like that for four hours. Now, this is called a, a stress position. Uh, one of the things I think we should pay a little attention to is the kind of language of euphemism uh, that is part of the entire torture debate or torture issue. issue. So in the government documents, this would be called a stress position. Uh, raising hands, sitting on my knees, I was like that for four hours. Then the interrogator came, he was looking at me while they were beating me. Then I stayed in this room for five days, naked with no clothes. Use of nudity to induce stress is what that's called in the documents. They put handcuffs on my hand and they cuffed me high for seven or eight hours. Now this is a classic technique of torture in which you essentially, he was handcuffed to the window and the idea is to put you on your toes uh, so that you have a choice between putting pressure on your shoulder or pressure on your feet and calves. Uh, and after a few minutes of this, you invariably let yourself down and eventually dislocates your shoulder. It's very painful. Um, they, cuffed me, they put handcuffs on my hand and cuffed me high for seven or eight hours. That caused a rupture to my right hand, and I had a cut that was bleeding and had pus coming from it. They kept me this way on 24, 25, and 26 October. So for three days, he's essentially like that on his, on his toes. In the following days, they also put a bag over my head. He means, he means a hood. Um, and of course, this whole time I was without clothes and without anything to sleep on. Now, the hood is uh, commonly referred to as sensory deprivation. Put it over your head, it's absolutely black. You can't see anything. Uh, your hearing is also affected. You can't hear very much. It's often used, well, uh, anyway. I was without clothes and without anything to sleep on. One day in November, they started a different type of punishment where an American police came in, he means military police, came into my room, put the bag over my head and cuffed my hands, and he took me out of the room into the hallway. He started beating me, him and five other military police. I could see their feet only from under the bag. It's another use of the hood, which is to increase the effectiveness of beatings. Because you can't, you don't know a blow is coming, you can't cringe, you can't move to protect yourself. It makes beatings much more uh, painful and much more effective. A couple of those police, they were female because I heard their voices and I saw two of the police that were hitting me before they put the bag over my head. One of them was wearing glasses. I couldn't read his name because he put tape over his, his name. I mean, he's on the uniform. Uh, some of the th things they did was make me sit down like a dog and they ho would hold the string from the bag and they made me bark like a dog and they were laughing at me. One of the police was telling me to crawl in Arabic, so I crawled on my stomach and the police were spitting on me when I was crawling and hitting me. Then the police started beating me on my kidneys and they hit me on my right ear. It started bleeding and I lost consciousness. Um, I won't go on this particular paragraph, but he's beaten to the extent that he loses consciousness a number of times. His ear is mostly torn off uh, and one of the interrogators comes in and sews the ear on uh, in the cell. Um, a few days before they hit me on my ear, the American police, the guy who wears glasses, he put women's underwear over my head. 
And then he tied me to the window that is in the cell with my hands behind my back until I lost consciousness. Uh, this is, again, the same kind of stress position. It was used a lot in the Algerian war by the French. It's pulling somebody up from the back and trying to dislocate their, uh, their shoulders. Very painful. Uh, they told me to, also when I was in room number one, they told me to lay down in my stomach. They were jumping from the bed onto my back and onto my legs. The other two were spitting on me and calling me names. They held my hands and legs. Uh, after the guy, remember he is naked all this time. After the guy with the glasses got tired, two of the American soldiers brought me to the ground, tied my hands to the door while laying down on my stomach. One of the police was pissing on me and laughing at me. The soldier and his friend told me in a loud voice to lie down, so I did that. Then the policeman was opening my legs with a bag over my head and he sat down between my legs on his knees and I was looking at him from under the bag and they wanted to do me because I saw him and he was opening his pants. So I started screaming loudly and the other police started hitting me with his feet, uh, hitting me with his feet on my neck and he put his feet on my head so I couldn't scream. Then they put the loudspeaker inside the room and they closed the door and he was yelling into the microphone. This is called use of noise to induce stress. They took me to the room and they signaled me to get on the floor. One of the police, he put part of his stick that he always carries inside my ass. I felt it going inside me about two centimeters, approximately. I started screaming, he pulled it out, he washed it with water inside the room. And then two American girls, he means female military police, that were there when they were beating me, they were, started hitting me with a ball made of sponge on my dick. When I was tied up in my room, one of the girls with blonde hair, she's white, she was playing with my dick. They were taking pictures of me during all these instances. Now, this is, as I say, um, there's, I've given you an abridged, uh, quite abridged version of this, of this deposition, uh, but this describes what happened over a series of days in October and November 2003. Um, now, one of the, the Torture really became a national interest, issue in the United States uh, with the publication of the, and the broadcast of the Abu Ghraib's photographs in April 2004, even though it had been regularly written about in the press for at least a year and a half before then. But one of the interesting questions I think we as humanists have to ask ourselves is why when it came out in 2004 did it not have a more dramatic impact on our politics, first of all. Uh, and secondly, why did it then seem to go away? And I, I'm not sure of the answer to that, but I could speculate um, that in some sense, the grotesquerie of what happened, the grotesquerie of the pictures of what was depicted, and the grotesquerie of, of what I've just read you, the outlandishness, supported the argument that the administration eventually made, which is that this stuff was so bad it had to be perpetrated by a few bad apples, the few bad apples theory, uh, which is a theory, by the way, for those of you who are interested in the history of torture and democracies, is commonly advanced by democracies who were accused of torture and caught at it. Uh, a notable case is the British in Northern Ireland in 1974, the so-called Five Techniques case. These were just rotten apples. And because this stuff is so ugly and seems so perverse, Americans were willing, on the whole, to believe this explanation. At least a lot of them were. I want to read you something else um, before we talk about the explanation a little. And that is a statement by a couple of several journalists who were working for Reuters, they were Arabs, they were working for a Western news organization, as often happens in Iraq, and they were arrested uh, by the American military in early 2004, in January. Uh, they were near the scene of a helicopter that had been shot down. They were filming footage of the helicopter. Um, now, this was a deposition that they did about their treatment after they were arrested. These are people with full documentation, IDs, everything. Um, when, the soldiers approached, when the soldiers approached them, they were standing by their car, a blue opal. Salim Uribe, who had worked for Reuters as a cameraman for 12 years, 
shouted, Reuters, Reuters, journalists, journalists. At least one shot was fired into the ground close to them. They were thrown to the ground and soldiers placed guns to their heads. Their car was searched. Soldiers found their camera equipment and press badges and discovered no weapons of any kind. Their hands were cuffed behind their backs and they were thrown roughly into a Humvee where they lay on the floor. Once they arrived at the U.S. base, this was forward oper operating base Volturno near Fallujah. So nothing to do with Abu Ghraib, completely different place, not a prison. This was actually uh, a combat base near Fallujah. After they arrived at the U.S. base, they were kept in a holding area with around 40 other prisoners in a large room with several open windows. It was bitterly cold. This was January. Hoods were al alternately placed on their heads and taken off again. Deafening music was played on loudspeakers directly into their ears, and they were told to dance around the room. Sometimes when they were doing this, soldiers would shine very bright flashlights directly into their eyes and hit them with the flashlights. They were told to lie on the floor and wiggle their backsides in the air to the music. They were t told to do repeated push-ups and to repeatedly stand up from a crouching position and then return to the crouching position. Soldiers would move among them, whispering things in their ear. Salam says they whispered that they wanted to have sex with him and were saying, come on, just for a little while, just for a few minutes. They also said he should bring his wife so they could have sex with her. Soldiers would whisper in their ears, one, two, three, and then shout something loudly right beside their ear. All of this went on all night. Ahmed said he collapsed by morning. Satar, Satar said he collapsed after Ahmed and began vomiting. When they were taken individually for interrogation, they were interrogated by two American soldiers and an Arab interpreter. All three shouted abuse at them. They were accused of shooting down the helicopter. Salam, Ahmed, and Satar all reported that for their first interrogation, they were told to kneel on the floor with their feet raised off the floor and with their hands raised in the air. If they let their feet or hands drop, they were slapped and shouted at. Ahmed said he was forced to insert a finger into his anus and lick it. He was also forced to lick and chew a shoe. For some of the interrogation, tissue paper was placed in his mouth, and he had difficulty breathing and speaking. Satar, too, said he was forced to insert a finger into his anus and lick it. He was then told to insert this finger in his nose during questioning, still kneeling with his feet off the ground and his other arm in the air. The Arab interpreter told him he looked like an elephant. Ahmad and Satar both said they were given badges with the letter C on it. They did not know what the badges meant, but whenever they were being taken from one place to another in the base, the base is enormous, I should say, whenever they were taken from one place to another in the base, if any soldier saw their badge, they would stop them and hurl abuse. Slap them, excuse me, and hurl abuse. Um, now, I've read this because this is a completely different place than Abu Ghraib. It's not a prison, but you see that however outlandish what was done to detainee seven seems, that you see many of the same themes in this treatment of other prisoners who were simply taken to a combat base, that this is clearly a protocol uh, that the military uses in various forms to break prisoners. Um, some of the themes are quite familiar, uh, sexual degradation, threats of violation and sometimes violation itself, threats to sexually violate uh, family members, um, repeated use of humiliation by putting people on the ground and putting feet on them and so on. You can see, in effect, what I'd call a kind of narrative in these interrogations if you look at enough of them. Uh, if you interpret it like short stories, for example, you can see themes that return again and again and again, and it's unquestionably true that this was ordered, that this was something that has been put together and used repeatedly. Um, but the administration was able to argue, apparently convincingly, uh, to many people um, that this was represented the activities of a few rogue soldiers uh, who were untrained and who were performing like, as James Schlesinger, one of the investigators put it, animal house on the night shift. Well, the question is, how did this happen and what brought us to this pass? Um, 
I'd like to give one other account that isn't of torture, um, but I think that's necessary to talk more broadly about torture, because it seems to me that torture we can look at as the kind of extreme case, um, or the perfect case, as it were, for what I've called uh, in some of my writing, Bush's state of exception. State of exception being a broad term uh, that encompasses as subsets the notion of uh, martial law, uh, state of siege, state of emergency. Now, there has never been a state of siege or a state of emergency declared, um, but in fact, indeed, it seems to me we're living under that state of emergency right now. Uh, it resulted from a number of laws and changes in our laws, and above all, administrative changes uh, executive orders that were issued uh, in the days after 9-11 and that up to now have largely gone unchallenged. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about that state of exception um, and then go back to the general theme uh, of torture. Um, state of exception, by the way, I take from uh, the Italian philosopher Giorgio, Giorgio Agamben. Does anybody know that book which is titled State of Exception? Anyone out there? Yes, I get some nods, mostly from the front, front row. <laughs> well, it, it's a very small book, and I think, uh, you know, about 100 pages, very elegant, small book, about states of emergency, essentially. Um, and it's an extremely, if I'm going to hand out book recommendations beyond my own, I would say, uh, <laughs> by, by, I don't recommend my own especially, but by the, by the Agamben book, Giorgio Agamben. Um, okay. Now, Agamben, in talking about the state of exception, takes his point of departure uh, from the Weimar and Nazi legal theorist Carl Schmitt, who declared in the famous first words of his masterpiece, Political Theology, that sovereign is he who decides the exception. That's the opening line of the book. And by that, he means that it seems to me that to find the ultimate source of power means to find the person, organization, agency, force who has the power to set the legal regime aside. Um, and in the United States, it seems to me, we've seen over the last six years that sovereign is very much uh, the president. Um, sovereignty or sovereign power resides in the body or institution that decides to impose the state of emergency and suspend the normal law. That is, the sovereign is he can, who can set aside legality. Sovereignty, or the sovereign, is the one who remains after legality is set aside. Um, Agamben talks about, as many theorists have, the close relationship of the state of exception to civil war, insurrection, resistance. He notes the dependence of both the Nazi and the Soviet regimes on legalized states of exception. And he calls the state of exception a legal civil war that allows for the physical elimination not only of political adversaries, but of entire categories of citizens who for some reason cannot be integrated into the political system. The state of exception, he says, appears in the threshold of indeterminacy between democracy and absolutism. I think that if we want to understand the outlines, the borderlines, as it were, of our current state of exception, uh, we have to look back 30 years or so um, to those last days uh, the crumbling last days of Vietnam. Um, this is a parallel that's been on my mind a lot late, lately, not simply because of the death of Gerald Ford, which seemed perfectly well-timed somehow, um, but because at the heart of, um, it seems to me, our current state of exception are a couple of gentlemen who at the time were the wunderkind of American politics. I'm talking about uh, Richard B. Cheney, who was Ford's chief of staff at the very young age of 34, and Donald Rumsfeld, who uh, was chief of staff to Ford and then became the youngest secretary of defense ever. Uh, he's now become the oldest secretary of defense ever as well. Aren't we lucky that that was the case? Um, I think 
to talk about the present state of exception, you have to look back not only to those days and the collapse of executive power at the end of the Nixon and Ford administrations, uh, but to the determination on the part of those men, other powerful men who traced their careers from that time, uh, their determination to retrieve the liniments of presidential power and to return them to full health. Uh, Vice President Cheney has been qu quite candid about this, about his opinions uh, on the need to bolster presidential and executive power. In fact, at the time, he made his clearest and fullest statement of his determination at the time of the revelation uh, of the National Security Wiretap Program uh, in December 2005. He was on a plane uh, making some trips to the Middle East. Uh, he had a press crew aboard with him. They asked him what, how he would defend this program that was wiretapping, listening in on the conversations of American citizens without warrants, looking at their emails. We're not sure how extensive it was, but it seems to have been pretty extensive. Um, and he, they asked him, frankly, what he thought about that program. And he said, I have the view that over the years there's been an erosion of presidential power and authority. It's reflected in a number of developments, including the War Powers Act, which many people, he says, believe is unconstitutional. It's never really been tested. We sort of have an understanding when we commit force that the U.S., the government, the executive branch will notify Congress. It's never been tested. It will be tested at some point. I am one of those who believes that that the War Powers Resolution was an infringement upon the authority of the President. A lot of other things around Watergate and Vietnam, both in the 70s, served to erode that authority. The authority I think the President needs to be effective, especially in the national security area. Um, he talks about a document he wrote, let's see. Um, I do believe that, especially in the day and age we live in, the nature of the threats we face, uh, as, as it was true during the Cold War, uh, that the President of the United States needs to have his constitutional powers unimpaired, if you will, in terms of the conduct of national security. I believe in a strong, robust executive authority, and I think that the world we live in demands it. Watergate and a lot of the things around Watergate and Vietnam, both during the 70s, served, I think, to erode that authority, which the President needs to be effective, uh, and so on. And I think when you look at what, how the administration has handled a number of these issues, uh, which is by circumventing the Congress, a Congress that was very willing, certainly in the days after 9-11, to give them the authority they wanted, and the national security wiretapping is one example of that. They could have gone to Congress, they could have had the law revised. Uh, this is again a law, Watergate Earl law from 1978. Um, the FISA law, they could have had it revised, they decided not to. They wanted essentially to demonstrate that this power to wiretap, to interrogate, uh, and other things that I'll talk about, belonged to the president alone. Now, Agamben argues that in the United States, a theory of the state of exception, meaning a theory of state of emergency, in the American Constitution is a dialectic between the powers of the President and those of Congress. The dialectic has taken shape historically and in an exemplary way already beginning with the Civil War as a conflict over supreme authority in an emergency situation, or in a Schmittian terms as a conflict over sovereign decision. The textual basis of the conflict lies first of all in Article I of the Constitution. Uh, Article I of course talks about says that the writ, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless in cases of rebellion or invasion the public safety may require it. Uh, but Agamben goes on to say, Article 1 does not specify which authority has the jurisdiction to decide on the suspension, whether it's Congress or the President. Even though prevailing opinion and the context of the passage leads one to assume that the clause is directed at Congress and not the President. The second point of conflict lies in the relation between another passage of Article 1, which declares that the power to declare war and to raise and support the Army and Navy rest with Congress, and Article 2, which states that the President shall be Commander-in-Chief of the Army and Navy of the United States. Now, I'm sorry to go on with all this constitutional, or all this quoting about the Constitution, but a point I want to make is that the analysis that Agamben gives, that in essence during a state of emergency of the sort that started with 
there's supposed to be a dialectic between the Congress and the President that in, on large issues like interrogation, wiretapping, and other things, that dialectic never happened. In part because, in large part, I think, because the Bush administration, especially uh, Cheney and Rumsfeld, didn't want it to happen. They wanted to declare this power was theirs and not even recognize Congress, a Congress that would have been compliant. Um, the president himself has affirmed this on several occasions. Uh, he said also after the wiretapping was revealed, as president and commander in chief, I have the constitutional responsibility, constitutional authority to pre protect the president, etc. Article two of the Constitution gives me that that authority. Uh, he goes on to talk about that. Uh, and then he says the Congress gave him additional authority to use military force, which is the authorization of military force passed after 9-11. Then he says something very interesting. After September the 11th, one question my administration had to answer was, using the authorities I have, how do we effectively detect enemies hiding in our midst and prevent them from striking us again? I knew we were fighting a different kind of war, so I asked people in my administration to analyze how best for me and our government to do the job people expect us to do. We looked at possible scenarios. People responsible for helping us protect and defend came forth with the current program because it enables, enables us to move faster and quicker, and that's important, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, there's a different version of that decision by the president, which comes to us from Richard Clark, who says that on the night of 9-11 at the first national security meeting, how do we respond to this attack? The president said, I don't care what the international lawyers say, we're going to kick some ass. In other words, he explicitly said, forget about international law here, we are going to move and we're going to move effectively. Um, Agamba notes that after 9-11, the president continually referred to himself as commander-in-chief, which he says is a reference to the state of exception, attempting to produce a situation in which the emergency becomes the rule, and the very distinction between peace and war and foreign and civil war becomes impossible. Now, okay, so they're sitting around the table, the president says, kick some ass, and they start to change laws, change procedures, and move to a paradigm of prevention. Um, now, as it happened, administration lawyers had been uh, trying to concoct for some time ways to increase and bolster presidential power. So there were a number of procedures uh, on the table already. Uh, we know from Stephen Brill's book, After, and a number of others, that John Af Ashcroft, immediately after 9-11, pushed for an immediate suspension of habeas corpus. Uh, that is, he pushed to have the power, uh, habeas corpus is essentially one of the oldest, if not the oldest tradition of English jurisprudence, which says you cannot arrest somebody and take them away without court review. Uh, it means essentially produce the body. Ashcroft, the attorney general, wanted to suspend that. That was discussed uh, at the top levels of the administration. It was decided that would be a little bit too unsubtle. So they didn't do it, uh, though Ashcroft pushed very hard for it. So what are the liniments of Bush's state of exception uh, that actually were put into effect? Um, the first is the authorization of the use of military force, which was brought to Congress on September 14th, 2001. Now, this authorized the president to use all necessary and appropriate force against those nations, organizations, or persons he determined planned, authorized, committed, or aided the terrorist effects that occurred on September 11th, 2001, or acts of international terrorism against the United States, etc. Now, the interesting thing is the White House tried to insert into that sentence, after use all necessary and appropriate force, they wanted to include in the United States which would essentially have constituted a suspension of habeas corpus and given the president emergency, blunt emergency powers within the country itself. The Senate, one of the few times this happened, uh, the Senate was then of course controlled by Democrats uh, by a very narrow, the narrowest of margins, pushed back and wouldn't let him do that. Um, the resolution passed Congress by a vote of 98 to nothing and the House by a vote of 420 to one that's the Berkeley representative, by the way, who voted against it, I should say proudly. 
if your representative won't vote against a law like that, why live in Berkeley? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> okay, so there were no full warp time powers within the United States, though it should be noted that in the time since that authorization of military force was voted, the administration has referred to it again and again to justify uh, wiretapping to justify the kind of interrogation they've done to justify the imprisonment of Jose Padilla as an unlawful combatant. Many other things they have pointed to the authorization for the use of military force, which senators again and again have said we did not, that isn't what we were voting for. Second, the USA Patri Patriot Act, October 26, 2001, which empowered the Attorney General to take into custody any alien accused of activities that, quote, endangered the national security of the United States. Third, Bush's military order of November 13, 2001, which created the category of unlawful enemy combatants and allowed the indefinite detention and trial by military con commission of non-citizens suspected of involvement in terrorist activities. The president, they've used it, of course, on, on a couple of citizens as well. Fourth, the presidential finding of September 2001 in which the administration created the largest covert CIA program in history. This program, by the way, is known as GST, uh, and that is an, an abbreviation for we don't know. It's classified. <laughs> I wish I could tell you. It's hard to remember when you don't know what it stands for. Uh, it includes programs allowing the CIA to capture al-Qaeda suspects with help from foreign intelligence to maintain secret prisons ab abroad, so-called dark sites, to use so-called extreme interrogation techniques to maintain a fleet of aircraft to move detainees around the globe, um, to mine international financial records, eavesdrops on suspects anywhere in the world. Um, all of this, by the way, is dependent on legal cover, apparently, though, because we haven't seen this. Uh, Senator Patrick Leahy, this is one of the documents he's demanding the administration present. He's the incoming chairman of the Judiciary Committee. Uh, but apparently all of this, the legal cover for all of this is once again the authorization for the use of military force, which of course mentions none of this. Uh, fifth, the National Security Agency wiretapping program uh, revealed by the New York Times. Um, uh, though it would seem to violate the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, the NSA program entirely by bypasses the FISA court, FISA law, which was passed again in 1978. And sixth, uh, which is the last one I'll talk about, though you could go on, the series of memoranda and decisions leading up to the president's decision in February 2002 after significant debate within the administration, and it's worth emphasizing that, that the Geneva Conventions would not apply to prisoners in the war on terror though U.S. forces would act, quote, consistent with the principles of Geneva. This was absolutely critical in laying the groundwork for the torture that I talked about earlier. Um, I think these half dozen laws and decisions give a pretty good sense of the legal and institutional underpinning uh, of Bush's state of exception. Uh, what we have here is a blueprint um, for what administration officials called the new paradigm of prevention, uh, or the phrase that became used, uh, that was used very often after 9-11, taking the gloves off. Uh, that was a phrase that was used first operationally before the Senate uh, by Kofor Black, the head of uh, counterterrorism at the time. Uh, this was in late 2001. Um, uh, Apparently, Rumsfeld had originally used it in talking to the interrogators of John Walker Lind. Lind had been wounded in the leg. He was taped, duct taped to a stretcher, leaned against a, um, he was naked, leaned against a shipping container in Afghanistan. Uh, and the interrogators got on the phone to, uh, and, he, and he asked for a lawyer. He said, I'm an American citizen, I want a lawyer. Uh, they called, uh, they essentially got in touch with the Office of the Secretary of Defense. They were told, you can take the gloves off with this guy. Don't, don't worry about it. Um, Kofor Black then went before the Senate, said there was a before 9-11 and an after 9-11. After 9-11, the gloves came off. Now, I'm hypnotized by this phrase because I think it's deeply revealing and cuts to the heart of uh, how we are living now and how we came to live under the state of exception. Um, it's become so common that it's easy to miss its rather clear implications, which is that before 9-11, the gloves were on. The gloves were on. Uh, 
which is to say that the phrase suggests that the normal protections and processes of government had not only failed to protect the United States, but in their essence were inadequate to protect the country. Now the gloves are off. It suggests that what happened was not that people in the various bureaus and agencies and departments had failed to talk to one another and do their jobs, which is in fact what happened before 9-11. Um, it suggests instead that what led to the attacks was the fact that the gloves were on, which is to say that many of the laws and protections intended to protect individual rights, included those, including those passed during the 70s, uh, that Vice President Cheney so hates, were in fact responsible for the attacks, since they inhibited those who led the country from being able to defend it. Which is to say that at center, the idea of taking the gloves off, and this is a very prevalent idea in popular culture right now. There's a television program, 24. Does anybody here watch 24? Oh, come on, confess, you know. I can't believe, whenever I've asked audiences this, I always get sort of one timid hand, you know, I think more people have to watch it. It's a huge, it's a huge hit. How many people here have watched it? Ah, haha, -ha. gotcha. Well, that argument, the taking the gloves off, that the essence of security is being willing to shed our constitutional protections and being willing to torture, because of course, as you almost universally watch this program, as I've discovered, um, you know that torture is a part of almost every program. The assumption is that grown-ups know that torture is necessary to protect the country. That when you get to the grown-up level, uh, war is war and we need to torture. Um, okay. You know, I have to say also that the last, there's a psycho-political motive, I think, motivating the administration, a lot of this stuff that bears mentioning, uh, which is the simple exculpatory idea uh, that we let this happen. We're an administration with quite faulty legitimacy, the first one elected since 1888, uh, having won fewer votes than the other guy. We let this happen, um, and, uh, well, let me give a quote from Cheney. What I want to say to my Democratic friends is that they need to be very cautious not to seek political advantage by making incendiary suggestions that the White House had advanced information that would have prevented the tragic attacks of 9-11. Such commentary is thoroughly irresponsible and totally unworthy of national leaders in a time of war. Now, that quotation, which is from the spring of 2002, is in a sense a summary of Republican politics, Bush administration politics, for the five years after 9-11, going up to this past fall. Um, okay. Well, these and the other laws were the legislative and administrative skeleton of the so-called new paradigm of prevention, which we can contrast to the old model, which we might call, for the sake of uh, uh, time, the rule of law. The rule of law reserves coercion, detention, punishment, and the use of military force for those who've been shown on the basis of sound evidence and procedures to have committed some kind of wrongful act. The new paradigm of prevention, under this paradigm, the administration has imprisoned 5,000 foreign nationals in anti-terror preventative de detention, subjected 80,000 Arab and Muslim men to fingerprinting, issued 30,000 national security letters on average each year to businesses which require internet and financial and communications companies to disclose information about their customers without disclosing this to them. They've wiretapped Americans, their telephone calls, their emails without warrants, warrants excuse me, and ignoring the strictures of the FISA law. In the war on terror abroad, Meanwhile, the administration's detained a massive number of prisoners. We don't have accurate figures on this. Uh, the best estimate is from the Associated Press more than a year ago in a piece entitled, U.S. has detained 83,000 in war on terror. Uh, and this piece, I should say, I'm an admirer of journalistic craft, and this piece in a wonderful demonstration of journalistic craft noted that this number, you know, you're told you have to try to make abstractions visible. So the, the writer in the lead said that this number was nearly enough to fill the NFL's largest stadium, uh, which is where the Redskins play in Washington. Uh, 
Thousands of these prisoners were held in Afghanistan and Iraq, many hundred more uh, in the offshore prisons set up at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and the prison systems of various allies, including Egypt, Jordan, and Pakistan, and finally the secret network of so-called dark sites set up by the CIA in various countries around the world, including apparently Jordan, Pakistan, Diego Garcia, Romania, Poland, Morocco, and elsewhere. This, these prisons have been moving essentially. Um, uh, now, the story of these prisoners in the dark side is a large one, but the point I want to raise is that of their status. For in the case of many of these people, especially those in the dark sites, Bush's military order in Agamben's phrase radically erases any legal status of the individual, producing a legally unnameable and unclassifiable being. Neither prisoners nor persons accused, but simply detainees, they are the object of a pure de facto rule of a detention that is indefinite, not only in the temporal sense, but in its very nature as well, since it's entire, entirely removed from the law and from judicial oversight. So it's a different difference in kind, among other things, uh, not simply a difference um, in extent. Um, all right, so we're basically reduced to a world of pure security, uh, where human rights, where the balancing of human rights, the idea of the individual, who as Kant said, should always be treated as an end, not as a means to an end, becomes in essence a pure means to an end. Something from which you can get information, something which you should put in a jail to protect yourself from, but something that has in fact no inherent, uh, no inherent rights at all. Um, now, what, where does this leave us? This is a very sort of wide-ranging effort to give at the beginning of this program of yours on torture in the future where, we, where torture came from, how we, re, how we reached this point. I gave you a couple of examples at the beginning um, of detainees in Iraq. I want to say a couple of words about Guantanamo. Um, there is a great deal of literature about Guantanamo, about what's going on there. Much of it supplied, interestingly enough, uh, by the FBI. Uh, the FBI sent its uh, investigators, its counterterrorism people, down to Guantanamo to interview people, and they started to see uh, there's a difference in culture here between the FBI and the CIA and the military. They started to see the kind of abuse that was going on, and they started to write it down, essentially to cover their own asses, would be the uncharitable way to put it. Um, and so we have a great number of emails which describe what's going on in Guantanamo. It's on the ACLU website. They're easily obtainable. Um, I'm gonna read just a very short section of one of them. This is in, remember this is an FBI counterterrorism guy, so no uh, 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 liberal uh, activist uh, by any means, uh, who was down in August of 2004, so several months after Abu Ghraib, and he writes this to his chief. As requested, here's a brief summary of what I observed at Gitmo. On a couple of occasions, I, interviewed in, I entered interview rooms to find a detainee chained hand and foot in a fetal position to the floor with no chair, food, or water. Most times they had urinated or defecated on themselves and had been left there for 18 to 24 hours or more. On one occasion, the air conditioning was, had been turned down so far and the temperature was so cold in the room that the barefoot detainee was shivering with cold, shaking with cold. When I asked the MPs what was going on, I was told that the interrogators from the day prior had ordered this treatment and the detainee was not to be moved. On another occasion, the air conditioning had been turned off, making the temperature in the unventilated room well over 100 degrees. The detainee was almost unconscious on the floor with a pile of hair next to him. He had apparently been literally pulling his own hair out throughout the night. On another occasion, not only was the temperature unbearably hot, but extremely loud rap music was being played in the room and had been since the day before, with the detainee chained hand and foot in the fetal position on, on the floor, um, it goes on. Now you recognize uh, from the other description that these things are you know, adjustment of temperature, uh, use of stress position, use of noise to induce stress. Um, you can describe them as you like, they're described in the documents from the government uh, quite clearly. Um, 
Now, I said Into the Light of Day, that was my title. Um, I think there are a couple of senses of that. There's the optimistic one that we will start to confront these matters in the Congress in a more forthright way, and you will start to see in coming days arguments about them. But there's a rather pessimistic interpretation as well, which is that as the administration has suffered political damage, uh, mostly from the war in Iraq, not needless to say from this stuff, it has responded by using torture in, in essence as a tool of its politics. Um, I refer you to the speech that President Bush made on September 6th uh, of last year, which was essentially his kickoff uh, for the election campaign, the midterm election campaign. Uh, he made the speech in the White House uh, in front of a hand-picked audience that include many, included many of the 9-11 families. And this was his speech in which he talked about the alternative set of procedures that the government had developed to deal with terrorists. Um, this is a fascinating speech, I think one destined to go down in history. I'm not gonna read very much of it to you, but among other things he described uh, the interrogation of several prisoners who'd been in dark sites for four years, um, didn't know where they were, didn't know what had happened to them, they were completely isolated. As his questioning proceeded, said our president, it became clear that he had received training on how to resist interrogation. So the U CIA used an alternative set of procedures. These procedures were designed to be safe, to comply with our laws, our constitution, and our treaty obligations. The Department of Justice reviewed the authorized methods extensively and determined them to be lawful. You saw some of those words in the film uh, earlier tonight. I cannot describe the specific methods used, said the president. I think you understand why. If I did, it would help the terrorists learn how to resist questioning and to keep the information from us that we need to prevent new attacks on our country. But I can say the procedures were tough, they were safe, they were lawful, and they were necessary. Now, what are these procedures? The president can't describe them. I can, however, uh, possibly the detriment of our, our national security. I'll leave that for you to judge. Uh, we know about at least a half dozen of them. The attention grab. The interrogator forcefully grabs the shirt front of the prisoner and shakes him. Now, that's something that the Israelis used for many years, uh, shaking. Uh, and they stopped using it after they lost a number of prisoners because you can break, it's easy to break somebody's neck that way. Uh, second, the attention slap, an open-handed slap aimed at causing pain and triggering fear. The belly slap, a hard open-handed slap to the stomach. The aim is to cause pain but not internal injury. Doctors consulted advised against using a punch which could cause lasting internal damage. Long time standing. This technique is described as among the most effective. Prisoners are forced to stand handcuffed and with their feet shackled to an eyeball in the floor for more than 40 hours. More than 40 hours. It's a day and a half. Exhaustion and sleep deprivation are effective in yielding confessions. The cold cell. The prisoner is left to stand naked in a cell kept near 50 degrees. Throughout the time in the cell, the prisoner is doused with cold water. And finally, and most famously, waterboarding. The prisoner is ba bound to an inclined board, feet raised and head slightly below the feet. Uh, cellophane is wrapped over the prisoner's face, water is poured over him. Unavoidably, the gag reflex kicks in and a terrifying fear of drowning leads to almost instant pleas to bring the treatment to a halt. Uh, now, waterboarding, by the way, all of these are kind of greatest hits of torture. You know, if you study this stuff at all, these are very common. Waterboarding, in particular, was used a lot by the French in Algeria. It was used, it's used, been used throughout Latin America. Uh, Argentina, where I first wrote about some of these issues, used it during the Dirty War. They called it El Submarino, as did the, the Salvadorans. Uh, Latin America in general uh, was a favorite use. They would strap someone to a board. Usually, you beat them fairly savagely first, you strap them naked to a board, you then lift up the feet end of the board and their head is submerged in a bucket of water. Usually it's fetid water, soapy water, dirty water, urine sometimes. It goes down their nose into their lungs and you have an immediate sensation of drowning. Um, so this is kind of greatest, uh, greatest hits. We've seen it before. Now, how are these used? 
Um, there's a very good report on the use of these techniques uh, by Jim Risen of the New York Times, uh, who talked to a number of people within the CIA. I mean, the reason you get leaks like this, of course, is that people in these agencies uh, oppose these things, which is, you know, I have a whole book of documents that were essentially leaked because people within the government oppose them. Uh, so the government should not be looked at, at uh, monolithically, needless to say, as a monolith. Um, now, he talks about the use of these techniques by the CIA based on his interviews uh, with CIA, say, excuse me, CIA officers. Um, waterboarding is used not just once to simulate torture, but over and over again. Uh, according to several intelligence sources, a C secret CIA report describes how Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was subjected to the application of several types of harsh interrogation techniques approximately 100 times over a period of two weeks. Prisoners have been forced into coffin-like boxes, forced into cells where they are alter alternately denied all light and put into brightly lit rooms and denied sleep for long periods. They're subjected to long hours of extremely loud rap music, and they're forced to stand or squat in stress position for many hours at a time. Uh, if you read the interrogations report, you see that what is being done is torture, said a CIA source who's read the reports. It's the accumulation of all the procedures and how frequently they're being used that makes it torture. The reports are horrifying to read. Um, Well, again, these are things that we know about. And one of the questions, I guess, I'd like to ask um, is how did the government impose these things, mostly with our knowing about it? Uh, and they've continued. Um, it's fascinating when you go through these documents, they're wonderful little tidbits uh, that probably some people in this audience know about. One of my favorite is a little notation in the hand of Donald Rumsfeld on one of the pages in which he approves specific techniques. Uh, this is from, uh, I believe, 2000, late 2003. Uh, he checks a number of boxes, says you can do this, you can do that. Standing for five hours, he says, uh, and then there's a little note at the bottom. However, I stand for eight to 10 hours a day why is standing limited to five hours? This is in his hand. Now, you chuckle at this, I chuckle at it, uh, but then the question is, well, what exactly are we chuckling at? Um, I mean, what does that say about him? Does it say he's a sadist? Um, what does it say? I mean, Donald Rumsfeld, as many of you may know, used to use a stand-up desk. That's what he's talking about. So he works standing up at a desk, and you know, so he works, people bring in coffee, he has meetings, he does this, he does that, and he says he stands for eight to 10 hours a day. Um, but how similar is that to what he is imposing on these people? Um, it's an interesting thing about standing, forced standing. Um, you know, a lot of these things, and I'm fascinated by how bureaucracies work, how you can order these things. And I think one of the necessities of ordering these procedures is essentially, uh, distancing oneself from any sense of, sense of empathy about what exactly they do, what the results are. And that's why I think that statement, that little note on the part of Rumsfeld is so interesting. It's clear he didn't have a clear sense of what exactly, and didn't want to have a clear sense of what exactly he was ordering. The uh, forced standing torture comes from the Soviets. I mean, it doesn't come from them, but the Soviets made uh, very profitable use of it. Um, and the CIA studied Soviet techniques. I know you're gonna have Alfred McCoy here in this uh, series, he's an expert on this. Um, and he will know, and he quotes in his book, a report by a couple of CIA psychologists who looked at forced standing as used by the Soviets and analyzed uh, its effect. Um, let's see. After 18 to 20, now remember the CIA now uses it for 40 hours. After 18 to 24 hours of continuous standing, there's an accumulation of fluid in the legs. This dependent edema is produced by the extravasation of fluid from the blood vessels. The ankles and feet of the prisoners swell to twice their normal circumference. So if you can imagine that, feet and ankles swollen out, which you see in certain illnesses sometime, quite grotesque. 
The edema may rise up the legs as high as the middle of the thighs. The skin becomes tense and intensely painful. Large blisters develop, which break and exude watery serum. The accumulation of bodily fluid in the legs produces impairment of the circulation. The heart rate increases, fainting may occur. Eventually, there's renal shutdown and urine production ceases. Urea and other metabolites accumulate in the blood. The prisoner becomes thirsty. Um, the psychos psychosis is eventually produced by a combination of circulatory impairment, lack of sleep, uh, and uremia. So this is the alternative set of procedures that President Bush was recommending in a nationally televised speech on September 6th and was demanding that Congress essentially approve. Um, I strongly recommend anyone interested in this, anyone interested in this program, to have a look at that speech, which is on the White House uh, website. Um, he appeals to Congress to essentially legalize these things uh, and legalize the use of military commissions uh, to clarify the rules for our personnel fighting in the war on terror. Now, I watched this speech with a mounting sense of disbelief, thinking, my God, here is the President of the United States standing in front of the country saying, this is what we're doing. Congress is, uh, needs to make this legal. And I thought, well, that won't happen. And of course, uh, over the next month or so, you had a sort of shadow play in Washington uh, in which McCain stood up, among others, and said, no, 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 we can't pass this Military Commissions Act, not in the form it has taken. Uh, the Geneva Convention must apply, as the Supreme Court said uh, last uh, June, the Hamdan decision. Uh, and then you got a series of leaks within Washington. This was the headline in the Washington Post. I was there one morning to, to talk to the Baker Commission. I got up, got out, went outside my hotel room to find the Washington Post. The lead headline was, McCain's stand on detainees may pose risk for 2008 bid. That is, the fact that he was opposing this might uh, hurt his bid for president. And indeed, McCain very quickly capitulated. And you had a bill passed last October, during the presidential campaign, uh, that essentially removed the right of habeas corpus, um, uh, created the, uh, an even broader category of enemy combatants, uh, awarded to the president the sole authority to decide whether his actions were conforming to the Geneva Conventions, unprecedented, um, limited severely judicial review, and a number of other things. Suffice it to say that it's an amazing law that I think will go down in history. I think they'll be studying it in law schools alongside the Dred Scott decision uh, and other things. But the interesting fact I want to bring in front of you today as a kind of challenge is that th the politics of this law were all about the presidential, or excuse me, the midterm elections of last November. And the political uh, dynamic was the following. The president threw it out and dared Democrats to oppose it. The president went around the country campaigning for the law and saying, we need to interrogate prisoners in the war on terror. The Democrats don't think so. Um, as it happened, the Iraq war was a larger issue and this never gained traction. But how did the Democrats react to this? Well, they voted against it, but they didn't speak out against it. They didn't filibuster it, which they could have done. Uh, they didn't stop it from becoming law. So in October, the Military of, uh, Commissions Act became the law of the land. Uh, there was a wonderful comment from Laura Ingraham on Fox News, who was talking about why the president was going this way in the politics of torture. She said, the average American out there loves the show 24, OK? They love Jack Bauer. They love 24. In my mind, that's as close to having a na nationwide referendum that it's okay to use tough tactics against high-level Al-Qaeda operatives as we're gonna get, okay? I think we have to think about what she said and think about the appeal of that program uh, and the appeal of untrammeled executive power, which is essentially what that program is about the notion of untrammeled executive power as an answer to fear.
Um, I call it, or I think of it as the latest development of the Dirty Harry principle. Dirty Harry, of course, being the movie set in San Francisco in which uh, Clint Eastwood plays Harry Callahan. He's a cop who uses torture in a famous scene in Kizar Stadium uh, to break a serial killer and find out where one of his prisoners, one of his victims, her victims is. And of course, he's drummed out of the police force. Why? Because the authorities are liberal, they can't protect you, they're tied up in red tape, but Dirty Harry is a guy who cares, is willing to break the laws, break the rules, and protect the public. And 30 years later, Dirty Harry has become, in 24, the president. And Jack Bauer, who is under the direct authority of the president. Um, you've been very patient. I'd like to conclude with a couple of quotes and maybe then we can talk, I'll try to answer some of your questions. I know I've given you a lot of quotations tonight, maybe too many, but I can't resist a good quote. They seem to be much more eloquent than me. Um, one of them is from Agamben, whose book, again, State of Exception, I recommend. He writes, a state which, is security, which has security as its sole task and source of legitimacy is a fragile organism. It can always be provoked by terrorism to become itself terroristic. And this is another theme I think we have to keep in mind, the lucrative nature of fear, how politically lucrative it is, and what political payoff it's had for the Bush administration uh, for a long time until uh, the overwhelming unpopularity of the Iraq war. Agamben says, when politics reduces itself to police, the difference between state and terrorism threatens to disappear. In the end, security and terrorism may form a single deadly system in which they justify and legitimate each other's actions. Nothing's more important than a revision of the concept of security as a basic principle of state politics. And of course, that is the basic principle of the Bush administration politics, security. Finally, <laughs> I have a personal hero um, as a writer and as a man, uh, George Kennan, who I wrote about in a recent piece in the New York Review. He was an extraordinary diplomat uh, who, among other things, devised the uh, theory or doctrine of containment, although he argued that s successive administrations misused his ideas. Um, he had, his, his life spanned more than, I think he lived to be 102, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and as a young diplomat, he visited Hamburg uh, after World War II, which had been devastated by bombing, uh, by Allied bombing. 40,000 civilians had died in Hamburg. And he looked across the devastated city and wrote the following in his diary. He said, if the Western world really was going to make a valid pretense of a higher moral departure point, of greater sympathy and understanding for the human being as God made him, as expressed not only in himself but in the things he had wrought and cared about, then it had to learn to fight its wars morally as well as militarily, or to not fight them at all. For moral principles were a part of its strength. Shorn of this strength, it was no longer itself. Its victories were not real victories. The, vil the military would view this kind of thinking as naive. They would say that war is war, that when you're in it, you fight with everything you have or go down to defeat. But if that is the case, then there rests upon Western civilization, bitter as this may be, the obligation to be militarily stronger than its adversaries by a margin sufficient to enable it to dispense with those means which can stave off defeat only at the cost of undermining victory. It's an odd idea, the idea of keeping your morality through overwhelming strength and keeping the ability to fight wars morally. Um, I don't know if it's possible to do what Kennan suggests in that provocative quote. I do know that as you study uh, the idea of torture over the next few months in this remarkable program, I'd 
urge you to make the final resting point not on the torturers, not on the victims of torture, not on those people in air-conditioned rooms in Washington who made the decisions to torture, but on, at the end of the day, ourselves. Uh, because at the end of the day, we are the ones who watched this happen and are still watching it happen. I suppose that's not a very optimistic ending, but it's the ending nonetheless. Thank you very much for your attention.